five webinar on job matching, hire people who stay with you. I'm Mike Clem, a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our presenter today is Richard Lewine. More on Richard in just a minute. Uh, but first, let me provide you some information about SCORE. At the next slide, please, Richard. SCORE is a nationwide organization including over 11,000 volunteers with more than 300 offices around the country providing free advice to small business owners. SCORE Fairfield County is comprised of more than 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value added services to small business owners. Uh, first of all, we offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling which can be accessed via request a mentor link on our website or via the link on a screen. Uh, we also offer educational workshops and webinars, currently all in the webinar mode now. Uh, over 150 programs are offered each year. And finally, we offer uh, extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject matter experts at your disposal. Our next webinar is gonna be this coming Thursday at noon on how to turn your clients or patients into your sales force with Ed Winslow presenting. Please look for the details and register for this webinar on fairfieldcounty.score.org. Uh, now let me provide you some useful information about today's webinar. We have set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It's located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end sharply at 1 p.m. today to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next couple of days. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Our speaker today is Richard Lewine. Uh, Richard is the founder and president of RSL Consulting Group, an organization development consultancy Richard has over 35 years of experience working with the leaders of small and mid-sized for-profit and non-profit organizations, helping them clarify visions, formulate strategy, and create personal and organizational goal systems. Richard is also a certified SCORE counselor. In fact, Richard was a counselor with SCORE Fairfield County until he moved to Florida about five years ago, where he continues to be a very active SCORE counselor in Florida. Uh, Richard, it's great to have you back again presenting for SCORE Fairfield County. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you um, introduce your other uh, colleague as well. It's all yours. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be back in Fairfield County where I uh, really wet my feet with SCORE. It was um, a terrific discovery for me. My original connection to SCORE was in Philadelphia about a few years ago. And... Uh, as a client. Uh, and when I got to, to uh, Connecticut in um, 2010, 11 or 12, somewhere in there, SCORE was very helpful in helping me get my business back up and running from zero to uh, a good place. Today, um, let me introduce Dr. Al Raffetto. Dr. Al, he is called affectionately sometimes and without affection at other times. <laughs> And you'll find that neither Al nor I take ourselves too seriously, but we do take our work pretty seriously. As you can see from this screen, job matching is, um, is, is, is extremely important because if you've got 10 employees and they're not engaged, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. If you have one employee who's not engaged, it's gonna cost a lot of money. Al, did you wanna say something about that? Sure, and good morning. Thank you for all being here. Uh, I'm glad to work with Richard on this performance, this show. Uh, the, the notion of job matching is simple looking, but really very tricky. Uh, I had to learn how to do it when I got my first job as a psychology professor at Beloit College back in 1969 and discovered that I was hiring faculty members starting in 1970. Didn't know what I was doing. Hired over the subsequent 10, 12 years, uh, at least a dozen different faculty for four spots in the department. Um, the challenge was to find the right person who was a match 
to the type of psychology that we were trying to represent in the department. Very difficult. So difficult that I finally, uh, in 1983, told my boss, the provost, that uh, I was going to fire myself and leave Beloit College, which I did. And I was crazy enough to jump into the business world where, by gosh, they wanted me to help hire people. And in fact, I was in car dealerships learning how to hire car salespeople. Huge difference <laughs> because car salespeople have a simple metric. You either sell six to eight cars a month or you lose your job. And so therefore, if you hired people and they weren't any good, it was pretty clear how quickly that showed up. You have about two minutes left, Al. Well, thank you. So what was the secret? I don't know what the secret was. I was trying to figure out the secret myself as to how to identify somebody who could do a sales job. I will save the rest of the story to the end so that I don't eat up all this time. But the secret to the story is the kind of mindset you bring to your hiring situation. And there I'll stop. Which is a beautiful segue to um, the next slide, which talks about what this is really all about. And the, the, the toughest challenge, the biggest problem, and it is a problem, is that we see all the candidates through our own biases. And I know, don't know about anyone else, but I have biases. <laughs> so as an example, this many of you may have seen this uh, caricature before, and perhaps you, some of you haven't. But what do you see first when you look at this? A younger woman or an older woman? Your biases are going to have a great deal of effect on which you see first, and then you have to look for the other one. And um, we're not going to describe that. You, if you go on online and put an old woman, young woman um, puzzle, this will probably show up and you can practice. Um, so think about that for a minute, because that's the way you see your candidates as well. Do you see what you want to see or do you see what is there? Which is also questionable in and of itself. So let's talk about that. While we do tend to draw conclusions that meet our immediate needs, they are not necessarily the needs that actually need to be met in the organization. And remember, we're talking about an organization uh, if you look at that green piece in the jigsaw puzzle on the right side there, you'll fit right in. Well, fit right into what? All the other pieces are identical. They're white. There's nothing on them. There's no guidance as to what this new candidate is going to fit into. So you might ask yourself, is your organization prepared to actually identify what a real good fit is? The reality is the ideal is impossible. There is no perfect fit. The perfection is something that we chase. Uh, perfect has, is a, a word or a phrase that's been somehow crept into our society recently as a response. You sit at a table in a restaurant and you give the waitress or the waiter your order and they say, perfect. What does that mean? <laughs> I have always wondered about that or you have a discussion with a, a prospect or with one of your colleagues and they ask a question, you give an answer and they say, perfect. What? I'm not sure what perfect means. And certainly in job match, perfect is gonna be pretty hard to find, especially if the background of your organization looks like this puzzle. So thinking about the human bias, PG&E had a situation that actually did cause these California infernies. And since Al is from California originally, uh, he can address this a little better than I can because he was close to it, at least psychologically. Al? Yes. Uh, I, I wasn't in California then, I was in Wisconsin. However, I had the opportunity to uh, learn about some research that had been uh, purchased by PG&E with regards to their employees. Uh, and the research was about 
the level of engagement that the line workers were feeling about the organization. The results were not good. Uh, the line workers felt rather disengaged. And when you have disengaged workers, the things that they do are not necessarily all correct, proper, accurate, and worthy of the title of well done. Uh, now, that lasted until the first wildfires, wildfires of California hit and burned the, burned the town of Paradise to the ground, killed somewhere like 58 or 85 people. And it just did a lot of destruction. And of course, it was discovered that the fire started at, when a power line from PG&E uh, hit the ground, sparked, and began a fire. It was validated to the point where the company had to declare bankruptcy, uh, which it went into and recently came out of. Uh, generally now what happens, I have a brother in California, brother says that when there are fires like these again burning, what PG&E does is it shuts the power off in the area, uh, which at least prevents them from being uh, forced into bankruptcy and sued all to death. Uh, but it's not really that nice for the customers of PG&E who are sitting in there, sitting there in the dark or hoping that their generator has enough gasoline in it yeah. to run. So, so here's a here's the question about this. Where is the human bias in that situation? It can be looked at that uh, management at PG&E was biased in their concern about what the linemen were doing, because obviously they weren't having it checked. Their bias may have been, let them do whatever they want to do. I don't know that. I have no information about that. But certainly, the human factor was heavily involved here. So ask yourself and your colleagues, are you constantly running around putting out fires? If you had better matches in the various positions in your organization, or if you're a startup, if you're in a small business, if you're just getting to the place where you're thinking about hiring people, wouldn't it be a good idea to see if you can get the best match possible, not a perfect match, but the best match possible so you don't have to run around with your fire hose in play, putting out the fires that a bad match may start. Match, that's an interesting word under in this situation. So think about this bias thing. Here we are, you're trying to find somebody or many somebodies that are going to fit into several slots or one slot in the organization you're either building, have built, would like to move, change, transform, whatever you're doing, you're looking for people since that's what makes an organization go. So you have what is a multi-factor disorder. I don't know if we can call it a disorder, but it is three kinds of human bias. You have cognitive, how's your brain working? Emotional, how's your heart working? And behavioral, what are you doing with your body? Uh, obviously, or maybe it's not obvious, whatever the behavioral is, is certainly going to be a response to what your brain and your emotions are telling your body to do. So if you change just one, it isn't going to do anything. It's not going to make the changes that you need. You need to address all three kinds of human bias in order to enhance, improve the performance of an organization through its people. And that's really what it's always about, the people, which is why job matching is as important as it is. If we would spend more time at the front end, and this goes for all organizations of all sizes, ensuring that the best job match is what we're using or what we are getting, then um, most of the aggravation that comes down the road and down the pike would be reduced significantly because it's people that create the situations and people that solve the problems. So if you get the right person 
in a job that matches who they are, they are and what their attributes are, you have an opportunity for consistent performance. So how do we get rid of it? Well, I don't know how many of you have seen Westworld, but right now, the only thing we could do to get rid of human bias is to remove, remove the human recruiter. And the reality is that's not happening soon. Um, when they, this lady on the left here is they, the android, when they're better than us, right now, they're not better than us. Um, they are missing the ability to use non-cognitive skills or non-emotional and gestural evidence about candidates. They can't deal with that stuff today. AI is just not that good. You want to say anything about this, Al? You don't have to, but are you there? I'm here. Yeah, I just okay. clicked my got click my mute unmute. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The, you, can put your, uh, you can put your camera on if you want and people can see you. I could, eh? Yeah. No, I can't because I'm blocked. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be. I know I shouldn't be. Well, I agree with that. But... Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this, is, this is a guy who I met in Australia and he was giving a presentation. Uh, or it's a younger version of me. You can decide which. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, the issue here is that uh, there is the use of the word bias it just simply means you're not necessarily seeing whatever another person's reality is. You know, what is the real stuff and how do you get at it? The, the point so far is you just don't come in with a easygoing uh, two-step program and say, okay, this will take care of that and you will now have bias-free perfect picture matching of a candidate. Not going to happen, probably won't in my lifetime. I wish it would because I, if I learned how to do it, I'd sell a ton of it. You bet. But, but it just, it's not there. So, uh, and we can't wait for the artificial intelligence people to come up with a solution because frankly, until we do, they won't. Okay, that's enough. Okay, so here's the issue. Um, Michigan State did a study that said only 14% of intuitive, favorable interviews, bias, resulted in successful hires. I like how he looks. I like how she looks. I like the way they answered that question. Um, I like the way they stood. I like the way they shook hands. That's all intuitive stuff. I like the fact that the person looked me in the eye. I like the fact that um, he or she asked me a question, or I like the way they answered my question or I, they didn't dance around. Well, all of that is based on our response to who they are, human bias. It's intuitive. It's a favorable interview. Imagine what the resume looks like when what we, the latest statistics that I've seen on resumes is there's at least five lives in every resume. Well, okay, how do you figure what that is? So what should you use for hard data in your hiring process so that it isn't um, the, this 14% of intuitive favorable interviews that feels good. I mean, it's not bad to feel good about a candidate. We're not suggesting that for a minute, but we need something more than just the way we feel about it or the way they answered the question. And um, it, the, the statistics say that if we do that, we're going to get better than 14% in our job matching. So this is an interesting concept. Um, one of the things that gets in our way, now it depends on the organization, the organizational culture, who are the decision makers, who's doing the interviewing, who's deciding about who gets hired and who doesn't, who decided what's in each job description that we're trying to match. By the way, I hope you have job descriptions, exhaustive job descriptions rather than plain white jigsaw puzzle pieces. Otherwise you can't even get a lousy match, let alone a perfect match. So frequently what happens is the person in the position of doing the interview or getting the, per the candidates into the chair for an interview has fear. 
why do they have fear? Well, it's one heck of a responsibility to determine who's going to fill the slots that are empty. And in many organizations, it's not okay to make a mistake, unfortunately. Um, the word failure is not acceptable in many organizations, even though it does not have to be fatal. So if you look at what happens when someone or a group or an, an organizational culture operates with fear, what it feeds is complacency and it dissolves trust. So how does that affect the hiring or the uh, identification of good candidates? Well, the person doing it doesn't feel like they have control because in their head somewhere is, well, so-and-so will not like that person in this position because it's a woman and he's a chauvinist. Or uh, the woman doesn't want it because it's a man and she wants to make sure that there's more women on, in, on the team. These are all biases. So there's a problem here based on the organizational culture that's getting in the way. So the bias of the individual doing the interviewing is I have to protect my job. So they're gonna be thinking about what are the ramifications of my decisions, which means they're not really controlling what goes on. They're allowing the situation in the organization to govern the process. Not a good way to get a good job match. <laughs> so it, um, it really, it may not eliminate hope, but it, <laughs> hope meaning I hope I keep my job after I make this decision, or I hope this is the right candidate and I hope he, she performs after they get in. By the way, think about the people who performed wonderfully in your interview and then didn't do so great on the job. I'll bet there are a lot of us who have some of those in our companies. Anyhow, with that stuff gone, the fear will affect leadership with long lasting impairment. I know that may be hard to, to swallow, but if what happens is people keep operating from the position of fear or just go along with the flow, which is the complacency aspect, or they don't have trust in the way the uh, organization is gonna to respond to their decisions, the leadership in the organization will suffer. And if, or if leadership suffers and is not responsible and sustainable leadership, then it is going to generate what's under these two hands, turnover. And then you have to figure out who gets hurt most because everyone is hurt by turnover. These hands, by the way, give you the opportunity to put the F under the little pinky on whichever hand you like for fear and then complacency and then C, five. Remember, in order to have control and you look at our hands, our thumb and our index finger, create the, the quote, perfect sign or perhaps blue ribbon if you're old enough, <laughs> which was a beer from Northeast uh, part of the country. And it's also the opposable thumbs, which give us control, more control over our environment. So the fingers represent the ability to have hope because we have more control and we can, I would hope, create more responsible and sustainable leadership. So if we don't, if we get turnover, here's what happens. What's the cost of the business? Who creates or suffers the greatest emotional cost? And what does that really do to leadership? Al, can you address that for a moment? And I mean a moment. <laughs> sure. Any questions? How's that? That's good. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, let, let me give you a, I'll give you a pragmatic suggestion because Rich raised uh, having a job description. When you hear that, Frequently, the answer is, oh, my God, I don't have a job description. I have to list all the duties that I expect this person to perform. And you and you do that, and then you bullet point them so it looks official. Uh, and you then have a duty list, which ends usually with, and other duties as prescribed by management. This is a terrible piece of equipment. 
and it will not help you hire anybody effectively. Here's a secret suggestion just for you today. Instead of building a job description, build a competency or a critical competency list. What are the five most important characteristics this person has to have to be successful in this job? It's called five qualities. Do they have to be trustworthy? And that could be the first quality, whatever it is. And, it, and if you only have five and limit yourself to five, then when you have help doing the hiring, you can agree that these are the most important factors you should look for in all of the evidence you gather about each candidate. It is a much simpler and more effective way to organize a decision. Interesting, because the result of having the appropriate attributes, characteristics, five, three, 10, however many it is, five is plenty, that will determine the outcomes or the output of the behavior and performance of the candidate that you hire or those that are already in the company. Yeah. What we what is missing in most job descriptions is, okay, we want them to do all of these things. Why? <laughs> what is the purpose of them doing all of these things? And what does management want them to do after they've done all of those? <laughs> what is going to be produced? There has to be a reason for, first of all, that particular function in the organization to exist. Otherwise, get rid of it. Close it. Get rid of the people. You've just saved yourself 150 grand a year. Interesting. It is what are the outcomes? What is the output? What are the goals that need to be achieved by this person in this position, in this organization, in this period of time, and to what degree? They're the kinds of things that will help you make a better decision about who you're getting. Because as of Today, according to Gallup, who has been around for, I don't know how many generations, but a lot, their most recent polls about disengagement indicate that 90% of the workforce is disengaged to one degree or another. And th this, this slide is critically important as we think about job matching, because what we want to ensure is that the organization and the people in it are not anywhere near the bottom, which is where much of our population is at the moment or the workforce anyhow. They're aimless, they are fearful, they're complacent, they're, some of them are in misery and COVID by the way is a test. That's really what COVID is here to test us as a species. My wife says, she thinks maybe it is the first of something that's heading for another major extinction. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, so um, there's, a, th there's a relationship between these two double-headed arrows. And um, I'm going to let Al talk about it for just a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to mention and name Marty Seligman who is the father of positive psychology, created this blue one, the bottom floundering, but the top flourishing. And I don't know about you, but I wanna be flourishing, not floundering. And our organizations are in trouble because all of these people are on the floundering side. Al? The, yeah, the, <clears throat> the blue small arrow was in a, publication that Seligman put out uh, based on his Australia work with students and the state of uh, South Australia's government. It's, it's kind of exciting because when I first saw it, for, it was exciting for me because here was a psychologist, president of the American Psychological Association, who said, you know, just because you maybe help remove or lessen misery and with misery is what is down there when you're floundering just because you do that that doesn't mean you automatically increase flourishing flourishing is something different and what yes you need to stop floundering but yes you also need to be 
uh, assisted in how are you, how you are going to promote trust amongst yourselves and others, how you promote hope, how you exercise leadership, all of which will help you achieve a higher or perhaps a little better state of well-being. And COVID is the challenge to the well-being. I mean, it's a physical challenge. And we're sheltering in place. I'm here in Superior, Wisconsin, riches in Pompano Beach, Florida. We're sheltering in place. And it's a challenge because we can't see you. We can't see if you're liking us or disliking us. We're getting no feedback. And every day we are sheltered in place, our feedback about who we are and how we're doing diminishes. That is a challenge. You bet. And if you take a look on the right side where this list of various states uh, is starting with flourishing and ending with floundering, you'll notice that engagement, which is the byword in an organizational sense, and disengagement are both midway up the shaft of the arrow, not all the way at the top. We're not talking about happy, joyful, jumping up and down and dancing. We're talking about people who work in an organization who are engaged in the job they're doing, who are committed to the goals that they have accepted as theirs, if they're fortunate enough to have an organization that asks them if they can accept it, let's assume they can, they'll be engaged in the execution on that goal and that will help them and they are dependent on relationships. It can generate optimism as they achieve more, they have hope, the leadership is stronger and the reverse is also true. If there's uncertainty in either the leadership or the culture in general, negative emotions start to come into play, disengagement, it's like a clutch in a, how many of you still shift gears <laughs> in your car, that is? I don't know how many still do. I learned on that. Um, it, it, you begin to disengage the clutch so the transmission is not taking the power from the engine to the wheels. Well, the people are the engine uh, of the organization. If you disengage, the organization's wheels are not going to turn. And in the extreme, it becomes estrangement, anger, all kinds of other stuff begins to take over. It is pretty messy and leads to misery. So we need to get out of that. One of the ways is to be sure, as sure as is humanly possible, given our bias and our imperfection, that the, pardon me, the people in the organization have the attributes, the skills, the talents, the know-how to execute the jobs required in the position we're asking them to fulfill. This, when you get your copy of this, which will be available whenever Mike Clem says, um, take some time and go over this. And if you, do, if, if you don't do anything else, buy the book by Marty Seligman called The Hope Circuit, which is really the story of his life, but it explains how he got here. Fascinating book. So, now we get to the place where we have to figure out if this applicant in front of us, standing or sitting or laying down, depending on the job, we have to get to their life. And if they've lived, they've left clues behind. That's just the way it works. So how does an archeologist do it? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> Since what we're gonna be doing is peeling away layers from a human being, this is a picture of the outside of a human being. Well, oh, I'm sorry, no. It's the outside of a cave that an archeologist is going to dig into and find some things. And it happens to be, well, he happened to be a friend of Al. So I'm gonna let Al talk about this for a minute. Uh, just a minute, oh my God. That's all you have. No. Oh, well, I'll give you a minute and 30 seconds. Uh, and, yes, and I've already but, lost that, okay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the question or the metaphor is, well, now, you know, there are layers in the onion and you have to go through all the layers of the onion to see the real person and you have to peel this back and you have to do this and that to, in order to find somebody who is a fit to what you want. 
right? This is the issue at hand, job matching. How do you dig beneath the person's facade and find what's going on underneath that will be the things that will help you have the best match between yourself and the person you're hiring. Digging beneath the surface is the concept. My buddy, Bob Salzer, who late Bob Salzer, passed away a few months ago. He and I, uh, we hunted together, we canoed together, we went to bars together. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, and <laughs> he took me on archaeological. It'd be a better story, Al. Yeah, Could I be a know. Better story. <laughs> See, now he interrupts me. <laughs> but one day he called and said, I've, I've got this information. I want to go and see this place. Do you want to come along? I said, sure, I'll go. And so we drove from Sauk City, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, down the, down the Wisconsin River to a place called Muscaday to a farmer's field. And a farmer said, over there where you go down into the coulee, which is a little gully, you'll find... A rock shelter. So we went down there. We were armed because there were rattlesnakes and we thought that we might be attacked by rattlesnakes and we'd have to do bad things to them. Uh, so we went down and we got to this spot and sure enough, there's this rock shelter opening and Bob, the archaeologist, shines a light in there and he goes, oh my. You know, and I'm looking in and I said, well, I don't see anything. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I see, I see this, and what he saw was this rock painting, and he said that's that's the story of Redhorn. Now, as an archaeologist, he knew what he was looking for, and when he saw that, if you go to the next slide, Sorry, he man. began he began to show what was in that rock shelter, and he do, they dig artifacts out of the ground very carefully. He shows the story of Red Horn. This is now part of the Wisconsin lore about how the indigenous people used the Wisconsin River, the Mississippi River, to conduct their trade. And this place is on the historic site of, uh, or historic list of archaeological sites, digging beneath the surface. But Bob knew what to look for. He didn't, we just, you know, you didn't just go out and say, let's just dig here and see what we can find. You had to know what you were looking for. Otherwise, you would waste an awful lot of time and energy. Okay, is that enough for now? That's enough of that story. But it's a good one because it lays the groundwork for the human side of it. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Joe Harry window, uh, which is really... Every, Lots of houses, lots of homes, lots of lots of windows have four panes. So Joe and Harry were two guys, and I'll call them guys, they were psychologists, who came up with this concept of four quadrants that um, are the beginning of digging to figure out who this person is. So how far do you have to go? But let's start with what's right here. If the upper left quadrant the open self, it's what you know, what everybody else knows, you're happy to share it, talk about it, display it. It's just, you're an open book. Actually, you're probably chapter one and that's it. Then you have the second quadrant under it is what you know about you, but you have not shared that with other people knowingly. It doesn't mean that other people don't know about it but you've tried to keep it a secret or downplay it or some other thing. However, lots of folks are intuitive enough and enough of um, detectives to figure out, well, he says he's not, but he is, or she is, or, there, or she's not what she says she is. There's a whole different bunch of things here in that quadrant. Move to the upper right. This is, uh, this is an interesting one all by itself, the blind self. Now remember, you have these four quadrants as an interviewer and the candidate has these four quadrants as the interviewee. So we have <laughs> the blind leading the blind. Very interesting set of circumstances here because they don't know what you really like if you're down here in the hidden self, but they do know what you're projecting from behind your table or desk, or even if you're just standing there open. Uh, 
but you don't know that you're projecting it. You may not even know it about yourself. We all have blind spots. That's a great big deal that uh, create issues in or creates issues in organizations. And then there is this lower right quadrant, which is the totally unknown self. You don't know, and neither does anybody else. And what does that mean? And you know what? That's the one that will bite you in the behind every time because it'll come out under pressure when the fire is raging, when the clients are leaving, when whatever is, you can't get your supplies, there is something that will happen with that candidate that you put in the almost perfect slot that they didn't know and you didn't know. And you ask that question, this is one of my favorites that I got from Al, at the end of the interview, You've had an hour and a half. Five other people have interviewed this person. You have a resume. You've checked all the references. And you're there ready to consider making an offer. And you ask the question, is there anything else you would like to tell us that you haven't already told us before you get into the job? Think about that. Anyhow, once you get to this one, this will lead you to the kind of tools that are available to help you make a better decision. And I'm sure that lots of you are familiar with the DISC, which is interesting. It's also four quadrants. Do you know how old the DISC is in concept? About 400 BC, the Greeks used it for abnormal psych when they started to de develop psychology. And Al has a lot more information about that than I do. But that's how old it is. And think about it. You're putting a person in one of four boxes. That's, that's the choice. You don't have any other choices when you use that. And for those of us here in the States, I don't know who's on this call. I do work out of the country. Um, but if you're in this country, the EEOC does not, um, has not said, or the DISC does not meet the requirements for non-discrimination except as the job requires, according to the EEOC. It does, they does not meet their requirements. But there are a lot of other ways. You have four choices with the DISC. And this other thing that you're looking at here, which is the profile evaluation system, we're not selling it here. We're merely showing you for comparison. There's 171 possible combinations just on this one sheet compared to four. And it's a whole person. It isn't any one dimension or two or three or five. There's 18 on here and it's a whole person. With the disc, even if it's the whole person, it's only four. Think about what you're trying to do. You're trying to take an individual, a human being with human biases, with uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, threats and opportunities. Yes, call them a SWAT team member and you're trying to match that to a position where you don't even have a job description in many cases. And if you do, it doesn't tell you what the outcomes are, just what all those um, responsibilities and duties are. Well, I don't know if four will do it, but if you're a whole person and you can blend and make combinations, you can make a better determination as to whether or not this individual has a shot at consistent performance. That doesn't mean perfect performance. It means consistent performance in a given position for a period of time with clearly defined expectations. Al, do you want to take this a little further? Just one more thing. Uh, on this instrument, the profile, the first six levels at the top are called mental aptitude. No personality test goes anywhere near assessing what your mental capabilities are. That's a very strange sort of thing. And what I used to do to get the attention of a business owner is I would sit down and I would say, well, let me ask you this. So you have, you use the disc or you use whatever this thing is that is all per, by personality. When you hire somebody, do you expect them to bring a brain with them? You know, and you get this funny look, and what? <laughs> well, 
do you, are they supposed to bring a brain to the job? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, then why aren't you trying to assess their brain capability at least a little bit, just like you are so hell bent on assessing their personality as if that is all that matters. Think about a job match. Is this is this a match where a brain must be used useful <laughs> required or no brain? Oh, no, no, let's, no, no, yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll go with people who are really nice people. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, it's interesting when we have these discussions with clients about the tools that they use. And we, if you, if you just look at personality, half the person is not being evaluated, measured, uh, investigated as to whether or not they can do the job. And every job, I don't care what level, if you have a hierarchy in your organization, I don't care what level it is, the brain comes into play. <laughs> It just doesn't matter what the job is. So if you, and sometimes less brain power is better if someone isn't constantly being cerebral, it's better for the job because it the brain won't get in the way of doing a rote task compared to the other side where the brain has to be working overtime. So job matching, including personality and mental aptitudes, extremely important. And as we move through there, here are the factors that really will determine whether or not an individual um, will make it. We got our biases, we got our failure to determine, this is what creates the problems, failure to determine the real cost of hiring, overlooking the expense of a disengaged worker, turnovers, normal, all of that stuff. This Gallup poll came up with this cost with just 10 people in an organization that cost $132,000 a year if they're disengaged. Came up with TTI metrics, another um, pretty solid company, um, did also did surveys and did the analysis. And they came up with the actual numbers of the disengagement. Gallup came up with the percentage of people TTI came up with what did it, what does it cost? And if you have one person, 13,200 is a pretty big chunk of, of money. It's really um, something to think about no matter how big or small, new or old your business is. So it's, it's getting, hiring the right people. And, and this is interesting. We're ending this with the job matching. Hire people, stay with you. This is the, what we're doing today. We're hiring 10 people at $25 an hour. Um, they're disengaged for two hours a day. That's all this takes, by the way. They work an average of 22 days a month and there's 12 months. That's how we get the 132. Okay, that's done. So you're gonna do your best to hire somebody who's not disengaged for that amount of time. But all we have done today is talk about how do you find the right people? Now, the next time you hear from us, it'll be, how do you make sure they do stay in fact, even though you've taken steps to ensure that you have a fighting chance of keeping them in the organization once you get them, how do you make sure that they stay with you? That's the challenge. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. We hope you enjoyed this. It's been our pleasure. We enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Al, did you enjoy this? Oh, absolutely. This is what we do. We have a good time this way and we aggravate each other as well. So it ends up being a double whammy on the positive side. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Richard and Al. I uh, will use the remaining time we have for some Q&A. Okay. My first question here from Lance. Uh, back when you were talking about uh, workplace disengagement, uh, question from Lance is, uh, uh, what can be five solid attributes aside from trust? Good one. Al, that's yours. <laughs> So, so let's take it. Uh, trust and commitment. Commitment, good. Perseverance. 
um, passion, good passion. I don't mean that. passion for work. Uh, oh, and, old, I'm sorry. Uh, and self confidence. They're goal usually, directed. Goal directed. Five, six, but five, those are the, the five of the more fuzzy psychological stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did, you that know, get, may... did that get close to what I should have said? Yeah, you did good. You did okay. good. The reality is that every organization, depending on their culture, the business they're in, the levels of the organization, all of that stuff will determine even the best five generic characteristics or attributes of the individual. I mean, do they need to be um, an assertive person? Do they need to be someone who believes in tradition and following the rules all the time? Do they need to be someone who is trusting of others or who would rather uh, ask more questions and be a probing type of individual, um, more, more skeptical? not cynical, just skeptical. I mean, each one of these positions that any organization has available that they're trying to fill is going to have um, unique characteristic requirements for the people. That's why job matching is not just, well, they look good, the resume says, and um, the references also said, because today they're careful about what references say about people. And um, DISC says they're green. Okay, well, so we're gonna hire them. Yeah, it's really not that easy. That's why we've created this system. Next question. Another question is, um, uh, is it more important to hire based on the job fit versus the organizational fit? Ooh, that's a nasty question. <laughs> if, that's if, if, you stopped if, meeting if your the, wife if, yet. If, if, the job, <laughs> if the job is part of an organization and the job doesn't fit the organization, how are you going to gain support outside of your own department? Um, I, that, that suggests that there's a bigger problem, uh, which is an organizational problem of what is the organizational culture that's holding all of the employees focused in the same direction, moving in the same direction to get the results you wanna get. If the organizational fit isn't so good, trying to offset it with uh, a strong job fit is, um, you just made me, you fired me back to my academic life and why uh -oh. I left it. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, when, when a philosophy is wrong organizationally, it is hard to hire effectively in a department or a subgroup of the organization. That is I, what it is. Yep. Uh, I see it. I, actually, I can see the um, chat, Mike. Uh, what about the adaptability? as an attribute to be able to blend with the existing team and add value? Ooh, that's a good question. Another goodie. Yeah. Uh, there is a way to get at that. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it uh, versatility. Uh, and versatility, versatility is what is missing in the standard thousand-year-old, hundred-year-old tools that put people in boxes. Yep. That's, that denies the notion that people have the versatility to modify what they choose to use in their job on a day-to-day -day basis. The reason we have this problem of, of versatility is we don't measure it. We don't know how to measure it. Positive factors are measurable, including how they change over time. One of the reasons it's kind of handy to go to uh, the, the wellness model of the world is that you can look at things that blend together to exponentially sometimes increase the well-being of a person. Was that a too academic an answer? No, that was a goodie. It did well for an academic for an, for an old, kind of guy. For, for an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, another one for you guys is, um, do you have any specific recommendations regarding interviewing candidates in the current virtual remote environment of interviewing? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Siree. Yeah. Sure. Funny you should ask. Yeah. Can I do this? One yes, you may. Yeah, Jump thank on. you. Um, the, this is why I bring Al along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, let's let's establish a, a central theme. Uh, to do job matching and interviewing well, you need to adopt a mindset that is what I call the full glass mindset versus the empty glass mindset. In a full glass mindset, the person you are looking at virtually is the best possible person you could find for the job. Your task then is to ask questions that are provocative enough and get virtual and real information that's strong enough that you can say, okay, I didn't have to pour out any of the full glass with because there was an answer that wasn't very good. So you begin to look for all the things that accumulate into that perfect individual. Well, of course, that doesn't exist. So you'll always pour out a little thing, a little bit from the glass. The problem is, if you start virtual or real doing an interview as if you say, well, it's an empty glass and I'm going to ask questions. And when I'm happy about the number of answers that I like, then I'll decide that I'm in love with this person and I'm going to hire him or her. That doesn't work whether you're doing it in reality or in virtual. Virtual just demands that you have to do all the things necessary to read the entire person. Right now, the only person I can see is Richard. And I've been reading him for weeks now. And so I'm sort of, you know, he knows he's, I'm tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> see, and, and he, the phone rings now. Think about that. If you're in a job interview, do you let your phone ring? <laughs> you know, this, it's not a good, that's bad. So you have to look at all the subtleties, all of the things like the room, the ambiance, the, all of the, the gestural information, all of the nonverbal stuff along with the verbal stuff has to come across through this little window of, of a Zoom virtual session. And if you can pull that off properly, you see, I get him so angry, he leaves. Okay. <laughs> You want anything else you want me to tell you about? All right, Al, I'm gonna, we've got a one minute uh, uh, answer coming up here. Uh, okay. One final question. Um, you guys, now my phone is ringing. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, anyway, uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, Richard and uh, Al, some tools you use to assess candidates, DISC, et cetera. Do you recommend any formal pre employment testing? I guess that's like written test or something? Yes. He's he's muted. I, my short answer is muted too. Huh? No, my short answer is yes, of course. Uh, there are some very good tools which will give you clues as to the most important things individually, but more importantly, give you clues to combinations of factors that will work together to produce exceptional results. If you can't see those combinations, you're basically almost as, as impaired as if you were using a disc. How's that? Do you want names? I could give you any product I sell, of course. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's, All right. You know, Richard, there Richard are good you're things. on mute. Yep. See, he's, he's, Richard, yeah. you're on mute. There he is. Thank you. Uh, call Mike. Uh, and he will give you our information, my number, Al's number, and we're happy to talk to you offline. We don't want to take other people's time here. Okay. Hey, that's great, uh, Richard. Now, thank you very much for presenting today. Uh, as a reminder, recording of this webinar uh, and the materials are available in a couple of days on our website, fairfieldcounty.scorg.org. Uh, our next webinar is going to be this Thursday on how to turn your clients or patients into your sales force with Ed Winslow presenting. Please register on our website for that. Uh, and also remember, score office free individual one-on-one -on -one counseling. Uh, so please use the link on the screen to uh, request a mentor. Uh, and finally, uh, Richard and Al, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Richard, great to have you back at Square Fairfield County. That was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to be here. And thank you all for attending uh, today's webinar. Have a good day and stay healthy, everyone. Thank you. Al?